Good morning, everyone. My name is Lindsay Newton, and I am the Director of Community Engagement at the Missouri Historical Society. Thank you for joining us virtually today. We are so glad to be here. On behalf of MHS, I would like to welcome you to our newest programming series, STL History Live. Today's talk, Pandemics of the Past, St. Louis Responds, is one that undoubtedly resonates with us at this time. I know that some of you watching today are Missouri Historical Society members. Thank you. We are grateful for your support. And if you are not a member and would like to consider joining, we would love that. You can see a link to our website in the chat box. We also sincerely thank our city and county residents for your tax contributions through the Zoo Museum Tax District. All of this support is greatly appreciated, especially during this time. The presentation today will be roughly 20 minutes long, followed by about 10 minutes for Q&A. For Q&A today, you can submit questions through the Q&A button in your toolbar. And we would prefer you wait until the end so that we are able to see all of the questions. And please know that we will do our best, but we may not have time to get to all of your questions. And lastly, closed captioning is available today. To turn it on, you can scroll to the closed caption button along the toolbar on your screen. And now I'm going to turn this over to our speakers. Director of Library and Collections, Christopher Gordon will begin, followed by our Military and Firearms Curator, Mike Benzo. Thank you and enjoy. I think we're waiting for uh, waiting for Chris. Chris, are you able to turn on your screen? No, I'm not able to start the video. For some reason, it's not letting me. It's not letting you, Chris. No, I'm hitting start video and it's not doing anything. Maybe if I. Okay. There we go. All right, excellent. Thank you, Lindsay. Sorry for that uh, little technical difficulty there. So, uh, Fire, Pestilence, and Death, St. Louis, 1849. Uh, my book was released in February of 2018. And little did I know uh, when that book was, was released uh, that two years later I would find myself living through an actual pandemic. Uh, although living through this crisis uh, is providing me with a better understanding of the experiences of 1849, because now I personally know uh, and feel I under, better understand the anxiety uh, that people were experiencing uh, in 1849. And it is also interesting that although separated by 171 years, there are similarities uh, between these two events. Uh, I, I think the fear in 1849 uh, was compounded by the precarious nature of medicine and science at that time uh, and the little understanding of what was actually happening uh, in the world. And at least nowadays we have a better understanding of medicine uh, and we can uh, at least allay our fears a little bit of that way. Uh, there were six cholera pandemics that occurred uh, during the 19th century. Uh, the St. Louis cholera epidemic of 1849 was a part of uh, the second pandemic that was ravaging the world uh, at that time. Uh, cholera as a disease uh, is thought to have originated in uh, India and then spread uh, throughout the world. 
Uh, in uh, the second pandemic, it had spread to Europe. Uh, and the major cities in Europe were just being ravaged uh, during this time. Uh, London alone lost 50,000 people uh, by 1848 during the second pandemic. And with so much movement that was occurring between Europe uh, and America, uh, ships going back and forth, uh, people knew it was only a matter of time before the pandemic, the epidemic, uh, was going to reach St. Louis. Because St. Louis was a major port uh, on the Mississippi River. It was the second most important port city on the Mississippi. And thousands of new arrivals, uh, you know, arrived at the levee uh, in downtown St. Louis every month. Uh, and many of these were immigrants straight from Europe. Uh, and anxiety uh, at that time grew uh, mostly from the fact uh, that medicine was still so primitive and no one really understood what caused cholera, uh, how it was transmitted, uh, how to treat it. Uh, germ theory, which is the idea that germs cause diseases uh, was still not was still not discovered or understood for at least 20 more years after the 1849 epidemic uh, after the you know, it wasn't until after the Civil War. Uh, so people had all kinds of odd ideas about how cholera uh, was how it came about how people caught cholera um, what its causes were. And the most common belief at the time was that it was miasmatic, that it was caused by breathing bad air, that if you simply breathe something stinky, uh, some kind of odorous fumes, it would throw off the balance uh, of your body uh, and it would make you sick. Uh, and not only that, uh, the treatment at the time was completely unknown, misunderstood. Uh, cholera actually kills by dehydration uh, for the most part, but people did not really understand that. Uh, and so doctors were uh, affecting treatments that were sometimes worse than the disease itself. Uh, many doctors in 1849 were still bleeding people as, a, as treatments for all kinds of things. Or they were giving them medicine that ingredients included things like mercury and other poisons. Uh, so it's interesting, it would be interesting to know how many people actually died from bad treatment uh, as compared to uh, the disease itself. Uh, one thing that people did understand was that it helped uh, to isolate those with the disease or it helped to be away from areas that were actually experiencing an outbreak. Uh, and when cholera worsened in the spring of 1849, people who had the ability actually fled the city. Um, they went to the country, they went to healthier environments, uh, and the city itself became deserted. Uh, Joseph Mersman was a merchant in St. Louis in 1849, and uh, lucky for us, he kept a diary. That diary is now in the archives in Missouri Historical Society. And he wrote about this uh, lack of people and businesses uh, in the city, and you see this quote, business during the week this week was very dull. Uh, the great plague of the year of cholera is driving country person and merchants from the surrounding cities away. The city looks like a desert compared to its usual animated appearance. So that also sounds very similar uh, to what we're going through now. Uh, people were uh, leaving the city. They were leaving the city out of fear. Uh, businesses were shutting down. The city was under the control of something called the Committee on Public Health, uh, which had uh, taken uh, over from the city government for the most part uh, in response to the epidemic. And it instituted a quarantine measures for people entering the city by steamboat uh, in an attempt to uh, slow the progress of uh, the disease into the city. At first, they moored a steamboat about 10 miles south of the city on the river, 
uh, and physicians would, uh, they would stop boats and physicians would go out to the boats and check them. If anyone was ill, they would take them off and put them on uh, the steamboat St. Louis, which was operating as a hospital ship. Uh, they also knew that it wouldn't be long before the St. Louis was not going to be adequate to uh, hold sufferers of the disease. So they found an island uh, in the river near the old arsenal, uh, and they moved the quarantine station there. Uh, and uh, they moved the, at first they moved the St. Louis to the island. Uh, again, it operated as a hospital ship, uh, but eventually they would actually erect a, a hospital on the island. And officials had this whole system for stopping the incoming boats. Uh, they, would, they would be flagged down. The uh, physicians would row out to the boats. They would inspect them for ill people. Uh, they would pull the passengers off and put them uh, on the island. Uh, sometimes they would order the boats to be cleaned um, in response uh, to the disease. Uh, and the quarantine was, uh, people were to be quarantined for 10 days on the island. And unfortunately, uh, many people never left. Uh, they had to establish a graveyard on the island as well. Most of the uh, passengers that were uh, taken from these boats were immigrants. Uh, many Germans, many Irish, many English, uh, and like you see in this article from the Missouri Republican from the period. Um, and this was written while they were still using the St. Louis as a hospital ship. And if you see in the second paragraph there, it says there are now at quarantine ground 101 persons, all of whom are comfortably provided for on board the steamboat St. Louis. These are all Germans of whom there were yesterday evening only four sick, two women and two children. And what the interesting thing about that is, is that um, when you look back at the greatest number of victims of the cholera epidemic, immigrant women and children under the age of five were the, the greatest victims of the cholera. They, they suffered and died the most. Um, you also see this uh, uh, sentence that says an Englishman that had landed there the previous day uh, had, had died. Conditions were primitive. Uh, the physicians had to rely on nuns from the Sisters of Charity as nurses since there were no others at the time. And like now, healthcare workers were uh, exposed and many of them fell ill. And the city actually lost uh, several uh, doctors uh, to, uh, to cholera. The epidemic finally peaked in mid-July when 722 people died in one week. Uh, and then thereafter, the numbers began to steadily decrease. Uh, and by August 1st already, the epidemic was declared over in the city. Uh, the final death toll was 4,547, and with, again, women and children under five suffering the worst. Um, the actual death toll was probably much greater, uh, maybe as high as 10% of the city's population. Uh, Dr. William McFeeders, uh, who issued the report in 1850, noted that there were hundreds of people, their family members would uh, take them out to the country and bury them and never report the actual deaths to the city authorities. So the numbers were probably much, much higher. Quarantine station uh, on the island was actually used for future disease outbreaks, uh, such as the 1866 cholera epidemic that happened after the Civil War. Uh, but eventually the station was washed away uh, by flooding and it was gone by the late um, 1900s, uh, or, uh, 1800s, I mean. Uh, but other cities like Cape Girardeau also used quarantines during outbreaks too. And you see this uh, sign from the Board of Health of Cape Girardeau. Um, there was an 1878 uh, yellow fever outbreak. And so they would have quarantines similar to what they did in 49. Uh, the quarantine probably saved uh, St. Louis from greater damage in 1849. And I believe it lessened the occurrences among the general population. Uh, and it certainly taught city officials and physicians uh, that it could be effective. 
Uh, quarantine would also help St. Louis when another epidemic hit uh, 69 years later in, in 1918. Uh, and that is what Mike Benso is going to tell us about right now. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. So good morning, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be able to share with you a little bit about um, the 1918 influenza epidemic. I'm going to try and give you a sort of 30,000 feet uh, flyover uh, of this pandemic. And uh, to do so uh, in 10 minutes or less, I'll do my best uh, to do that. I'm going to focus on how St. Louis responded and um, the important role that uh, data uh, really played in being able to understand and track the, uh, the pandemic. So I'd like to start with this image. This is uh, some um, uh, newly drafted men uh, that are arriving at Camp Funston. And Camp Funston was the um, military training camp set up uh, as part of World War I preparations uh, at Fort Riley, Kansas. And the major component at uh, Camp Funston was the 89th Division. So these were the draftees from Kansas and Missouri, and they were sent there, uh, much like you see these folks. Uh, so almost all St. Louisans who were drafted uh, hopped on a train here in St. Louis and took that up to Fort Riley in Kansas and disembarked like these guys. What they then did was uh, get uh, indoctrinated into the Army, and they got out of those civilian clothes. And as you see here, they're packing them up and getting ready to ship those back uh, home. And what, uh, as they were getting ready to get um, shipped out themselves for World War I, what they didn't know uh, is that the influenza that would impact a third uh, of the world was swirling all around them. What we now know is that the influenza uh, epidemic is, can really be traced back to uh, here at Fort Riley where it really took off in mass uh, and uh, more than likely actually originated from a, a rural uh, Kansas County um, rather than Spain, which is what uh, many people believed at the time. We just had Passover and Easter, and uh, there were great debates here locally, and I'm sure around the country as well, about uh, how to uh, commemorate, how to celebrate. Uh, and so that uh, was uh, perhaps a bit of an issue uh, for these soldiers at Camp Funston back in April of 1918. This is a hilltop Easter service uh, where you can see um, maybe some people were practicing a little social distancing. I think it was more the arrangement uh, of the flags and the topography of the hillside uh, because the majority of folks were um, standing sh shoulder to shoulder uh, rather than the six foot distance um, that uh, we're practicing today. So in St. Louis, the first uh, cases that, um, that came to, uh, came to uh, occur in the city were really down at Jefferson Barracks. And um, the folks there uh, had some great impacts and they were treated uh, here at Jefferson Barracks Hospital that had opened up just a few years earlier. Um, this building still exists today. Uh, it is um, just outside of the National Guard post at Jefferson Barracks and behind the Missouri Civil War Museum. It's actually occupied by the um, Melville School District uh, offices. It's a little hard to recognize because of beautiful uh, porches and porticos are no longer there, um, but this is the same building uh, where uh, the influenza started uh, in 1918 and, and where uh, good folks like these Red Cross nurses that you see here and the medical staff at JB um, did everything they could to uh, try and uh, curtail uh, the spread of influenza. So much like the, uh, the nurses uh, today, they're right on the, the front lines of uh, fighting this battle. The other key person in the story is Dr. Max Starkloff. He was the public health commissioner in St. Louis, and he was uh, tracking what was happening um, with um, the influenza outbreak at Camp Funston as it spread throughout Europe, as so many of those soldiers in the um, US were um, in close quarters, uh, both in their training, in the uh, travel overseas, and certainly there uh, in the trenches of the war. And as the, the influenza spread there, it also came back with the soldiers in the second wave that really uh, was the most dramatic here in the fall of 1918. And so Starkloff was tracking that and making preparations on how to prepare the city. Uh, he uh, you know, documented a lot of this. It comes through in the newspaper accounts, but also did these annual reports that are a real wealth of information uh, about the steps that, um, that he took. And the key thing that Starkloff did uh, the very first action, and he writes about this in his report, is that he made sure that influenza 
um, was uh, reported that that was a mandate. So the Board of Aldermen passed an ordinance that required doctors to report influenza. And this would prove key because he could use that then to track the disease and also use those numbers uh, to help sort of drive the public health um, interventions uh, that, uh, that he became known for. So another key player uh, in the fight against influenza were, um, of course, the medical and health staffs uh, all across St. Louis, but the American Red Cross uh, as well. Uh, they marshaled their motor transport corps and um, they did other things, including um, publishing uh, flyers like the one you see here with precautions. And I'll call your attentions to uh, number two, uh, avoid crowds as much as possible. Number five, fresh air is always good. Uh, number nine, wash your hands frequently. Uh, and 13, um, spread this information as much as possible. And so information was key uh, then, just like it is today. So walk you through a little bit of headlines of the air to give a flavor of what was happening. Um, here you see before the first outbreak or the first case in St. Louis, Starcloth was writing about those cases on the East Coast, little articles in the newspaper as he was preparing the city uh, for what was to come. And the first St. Louisans that really were impacted were not in the city themselves. They were um, at Camp Funston. They were overseas uh, contracting the flu. They were on those ships coming back and in those ports on the East Coast. Uh, but also other training camps such as uh, Great Lakes, which is up in Chicago, where members of the Navy were. And so uh, right about the same time the first cases were here, there were St. Louisans who were out of town. Uh, kind of like Chris was saying, people left town to avoid it. Here it was everywhere, uh, and so you couldn't really escape it. Uh, as I mentioned, those first cases at the uh, end of September at Jefferson Barracks, and a few days later, that had spread to 500 cases. And so Starkloff went into action with his first um, efforts at being able to have some sort of uh, ban on public gatherings and closures. So taking effect on October 8th, they closed the schools, uh, theaters, um, churches, a number of places that they could where there were any kind of gathering uh, to really uh, try and curtail uh, the spread. And Starkloff is kind of pioneering in this because no one really knew how the flu spread. And so the theor one of the theories uh, was, was that it was spreading by personal contact. And so he was a real advocate of that and took some uh, pretty extreme measures. Um, so it continued to grow. And as you see here, uh, even then, uh, there are instructions on how to make your own flu mask. Um, another paper a few days later, uh, so five days later, uh, went from 500 cases at JB to 1,000. Uh, you'll see the governor uh, started taking statewide action of closing uh, theaters and schools, et cetera. Uh, and in the lower left of this newspaper article, you'll see the federal government was starting to um, address the financial strains that were on businesses and industries that were being closed down. So here they were uh, supporting the steel industry. Uh, at the same time, all this was happening, there was a war going on. And so um, there they were trying to um, keep building up for the war effort. At the same time, they were closing all of these businesses and that created a lot of tension. And just like today, there were a number of uh, well-known individuals and uh, political figures uh, who contracted the disease. In fact, the um, Speaker of the House, who was from Missouri, Champ Clark, contracted um, influenza and battled through that. Uh, at the same time that the, the government was trying to do this funding, was trying to create um, a federal level public health service uh, were among the debates at the same time. He did recover. Uh, however, uh, William uh, Borland, a uh, Missouri congressman from the Kansas City area, he died uh, a few days after visiting camps in uh, France. And then here you see Jacob Meeker, a congressman from the St. Louis area, died just 10 days after visiting troops at Jefferson Barracks. So uh, as the numbers started to or continue to increase, um, Starkloff took uh, more drastic actions, and so he put forth a, a plan to close uh, virtually all the businesses in the city uh, for a period of four days to try and really kind of shock the system. And this was met with great disapproval, and the Chamber of Commerce um, sort of instituted a protest. It's all happening in the same day as word spread about what the plan was. They protested, and by the end of the day, they had a new plan, and they exempted um, more than 30 businesses, or I shouldn't say just businesses, but industries uh, from um, from the ban, uh, including things like um, uh, you know grocery stores, coffee or, or uh, coffin makers, uh, auto repair facilities, uh, that kind of thing, and uh, and so these impacts, this four-day shutdown, uh, was uh, quite dramatic. 
uh, during the course uh, of that time, uh, the, uh, the war actually ended with the Germans uh, surrendering on November 11th. Um, and as they, uh, the numbers started to decrease, what they did is they relieve, uh, relaxed those restrictions. Uh, and so by the 13th, the restrictions came off and they became even uh, uh, looser. And then the numbers peaked again. And so we had this second wave that came uh, right away. And so by the middle of November, um, cases were back up on the rise. And this continued um, and through December. Uh, and by the near the toward the end of December, the numbers started to go down into early 1919 when the second wave happened. Uh, and so unfortunately, they learned that by relaxing the restrictions as soon, the second wave ended up being worse uh, than the first. So the big picture, here's kind of the numbers uh, of how uh, influenza uh, affected the world. A third of the global population fell ill. You'll see more than 50 million deaths worldwide, uh, 675,000 in the US and in the military, over a million cases, over 35,000 deaths. Uh, more local, uh, you see the statewide deaths just under 18, how Kansas City was impacted with about a third of the population of St. Louis um, and St. Louis with um, much less than as Chris showed us uh, with an over 4,500 deaths with cholera. Um, these methods that were employed um, reduced the, the deaths down to 2,800 uh, and change. So taking these numbers and the data that Starkloff was really uh, insistent on getting um, became really key for folks later on. So in 2007, um, medical doctors did an article for the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at what they called non-pharmaceutical interventions. We call social distancing, essentially. And um, they analyzed 43 cities and all the data that was collected in those cities, along with census data and newspaper articles, and compiled this really wonderful uh, report. And basically what it's showing is it's showing the uh, spread of influenza on the East Coast here, represented by this early peak, and then it moved uh, from east to west across the US with the Midwest values here in the middle and then a kind of a slightly higher peak along the west coast uh, a little bit later into uh, late October where it finally peaked on the west coast. So it moved geographically across the country and that gave people time to prepare and the numbers were a little bit lower and try new methods. The other thing that they did in their analysis is they looked at the types of social distancing measures. And so they picked out sort of three categories, isolation or quarantine, school closures or bans on public gathering. And you'll see here the percentages uh, that were used by these 43 cities uh, with most 22% uh, of the uh, cities employing uh, just purely a school closure. 34% did both um, school closure and a ban on public um, gatherings. And then 15 um, did all three. So in this analysis of these 43 uh, cities, these are the 43 sort of most populous cities uh, in the country. And they uh, crunched all this data and put it into a series of numbers that kind of helped tell the story. So this shows St. Louis's first case was on September 23rd. The death rate first started to accelerate on the 7th of October. And we employed our first um, intervention uh, the next day on the 8th. So Starcloth was very quick at, at putting those uh, um, actions, taking action. Uh, ultimately, the data can kind of get crunched down to this number you see at the end, which they call um, the sort of deaths per 100,000 population, which is a way of comparing all of the cities. So um, more recently, just a few weeks ago, National Geographic did a, a great article and wonderful series of graphics that helped illustrate this a little more clearly. Uh, so here you see four cities uh, and the way that that data uh, tracked out for them. So we've heard a lot about Philadelphia and the, uh, the huge spike that they had when they did not they held a Liberty Loan Parade to support the war effort um, and didn't close down the city and deaths um, skyrocketed. Uh, as compared to say St. Louis here in the lower right, uh, where you can see our curve was flattened essentially by the actions that were taken here in St. Louis. And the brown is showing you the, the range of the social distancing um, measures that were put in place. So you see the two blocks there, that little gap. And then as soon as that gap happened, those numbers so National Geographic produced these um, wonderful little charts showing you that actually the city with the highest death per 100,000 was Pittsburgh uh, and followed by these cities. Uh, other cities in the, in the survey, you start to see more happening of the second waves occurring here. And then their final uh, grouping uh, shows that St. Louis was sort of the fifth lowest uh, of the deaths per 100,000. So Starcluff's 
um, active measures and the community rallying around that and participating really curtailed the deaths here in St. Louis. Um, and the, the data seemed to be key. And looking at today, uh, we're using the, the city and county are using um, the same sort of data. This is happening all across the state, across the nation, at trying to help us analyze and help make the decisions about what to do. So this is a dashboard that's available for everyone to look at on the city website. The blue line is showing the number of cases uh, per day. Uh, they're being reported. The red down here is the number of deaths, so dramatically different than what we we're experiencing during uh, the influenza. It also can pinpoint and show you how many cases are per zip code. It can show you the ages that are being affected. As Chris mentioned, the cholera was impacting young people uh, and immigrants. And you see here, it's a little bit uh, an older population that seems to be most affected by COVID-19. Uh, and then gender is nearly uh, equal. And on the county uh, version of a similar dashboard, um, they're tracking the same sort of data um, but they're also able to show cases by race, which is kind of interesting. It's uh, impacting um, African Americans in much higher numbers, uh, which is uh, an interesting to learn and uh, how we're going to move forward and address that. So with that, uh, I guess I want to conclude by um, saying that I felt that uh, Max Starkloff not only saved lives in 1918 with his uh, interventions, but also his insistence on getting data to track the virus and uh, that those is uh, that information is continuing to pay dividends even today. So with that, if I can hit my magic button here to stop sharing, we'll bring that up. And I think we can take some um, questions and answers. If anyone has questions for us today, you can use the Q&A button at the, in the toolbar on your screen. No questions so far. Does anyone have any questions? Here's one. Oh, they're coming in, Andrew. Yeah, now they're coming in. <clears throat> How do you want to do that, Lindsay? Do you want me to take a stab at one of these, or? Yeah, go ahead and ask the ask the question and and respond. Okay. Um, someone asked in 1918, were there um, science deniers like there are now? Um, and there certainly were people that were questioning what was happening. It was, it was very uh, mysterious. No one really knew uh, how, how influenza worked. Um, it was small enough that it couldn't be sort of seen in the microscopes at the time. So there was a lot of speculation. Um, people were trying to figure it out. And then, of course, the actions that were taken were pretty dramatic, just like they are now. The idea of closing down all these businesses or closing down uh, churches, especially at Easter, uh, those kind of things. Uh, so there was great tension. As you saw, the Chamber of Commerce kind of pushed back on a lot of the restrictions that were happening. Um, uh, it'll take a little more digging uh, to, to get some of those great anecdotal uh, stories about individuals and, and how some of that was playing out. Um, but it was very much um, a, a, a dynamic environment, and there were people that weren't sure uh, that this was really going gonna, to gonna be effective. But so many people were impacted by it, um, not only um, locally, but globally. And at the time, we didn't have all of the social media and, and publications we did. Newspapers were the primary means in which people were gathering their information. So things spread um, uh, more slowly uh, in terms of information. And it gave people a little more time to reflect and, I guess, have those, those kind of conversations. Chris, it looks like you might have a question there. Yeah, there was, a, I think there was a question about how cholera is actually spread. Um, and it is spread through contaminated water. Um, so the, the uh, illness uh, gets in the, in the water system. Uh, that's how it is, is spreading around. You know, ships were transporting water. Uh, the um, victims had it, of course, themselves and, and would spread it, transmit it. Uh, and so the idea behind uh, the women and children being the uh, heaviest victims 
uh, is uh, the reason for that is that it's actually a an oral fecal uh, transmitted disease. So that makes sense when you think about mothers bathing uh, infants, uh, changing diapers, and so forth. Uh, that they're going to transmit that disease between uh, each other and then other members of the family. Uh, so uh, that is uh, the primary, uh, primary uh, method of transmission was this uh, contaminated water. Uh, and St. Louis at that time was uh, a really kind of a filthy place. Uh, the city had no real sewage system. Uh, Chateau's Pond, which was a large body of water that existed in downtown St. Louis at that time, had become a cesspool of industrial waste. Uh, and so the, you know, the conditions were right that it got into the water system and people who are living around uh, Chateau's Pond uh, suffered the highest death rates. There was a, a neighborhood that was immediately adjacent that became known as Shepherd's Graveyard uh, because so many people, uh, mostly immigrants, would move into these houses. Uh, they would contract the disease and they would die and then another family would move in and so forth and so on until the city finally had to step in and just, uh, you know, close up the houses and ban people from living close to the water. So it was it was all dependent on on transmission by water contaminated water. So it looks like there's a um, an, another question about uh, was there a national pandemic task force uh, during the previous epidemics? Um, and I can speak to 1918 and Chris, you could probably tell us if such a thing existed in 1849. Although I think I know the answer. Um, in uh, 1918, there wasn't uh, sort of a national effort. Things were being handled sort of city by city, not even state by state, like we're kind of seeing the level of response today. Um, each, each city, and not every city had a, a public health commissioner. Larger cities did, um, but everybody was kind of dealing with it as, as best that they could. Um, interestingly enough, I, I may have mentioned this just briefly uh, related to Champ Clark. When he got ill as a Speaker of the House, one of the debates they were having was actually about establishing um, the public health service at the federal level. So there wasn't anything at that time, they were having that debate in the middle of the crisis about should there, what level should the federal government be involved? And um, that sort of vote and plan got delayed a little bit during that illness, but eventually it did get created. Uh, and now those are a lot of the folks that you see on TV uh, today, uh, often standing next to the president, uh, the military members of the public health service, the surgeon general, is the leader of that group. So how about 1849, Chris? Was there a national response? There wasn't really a national response. Everything was local, but, uh, but and that wasn't a bad thing because people did certainly learn from it. Um, there was a couple questions there. One was, uh, how did St. Louis react to earlier and the earlier epidemic, which uh, hit uh, in 1832, 1833? Uh, and luckily, there was very few people in the city. The population was much smaller back then, so there was uh, much less effect on the city back then. And the, the physicians that lived uh, in the city at that time were able to gain a little bit of experience in dealing with it. So some of those same physicians helped out in 1849. Uh, and then there was an, uh, another question about uh, how did it affect later um, outbreaks and so forth in the city. And uh, as I said, uh, they continued to use the quarantine system, but also they began to um, found, establish um, infectious disease hospitals in the city. Uh, and so that was a, a reaction that came out of that as well. They also did things like improve the water system. They drained Chateau's Pond to get rid of all that stinky water that was laying around. Um, it, they put some um, public health measures uh, in force, uh, new ordinances. So they, they really did uh, learn a lot from it and, uh, and use that going forward. But there was still a lot of bizarre things that would happen in, in the following years. Cholera would uh, occasionally make a reappearance uh, in, in subsequent years. Uh, and when they were building the railroad uh, in those early 1850s, one of the things that the railroad companies did to try to decrease the amount of cholera is they gave their 
uh, railroad railroad workers barrels of whiskey to drink instead of water, uh, which had its own negative effects uh, that they discovered later on, like rioting and violence. Uh, so it wasn't uh, that obviously wasn't the answer. <laughs> the cure was worse, huh? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, another uh, question is about the um, Beyond the Red Cross. What were the responses from other non-governmental agencies during the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic? Um, and you know, I could dig into that a, a little bit more um, to have a better understanding. But um, uh, what was happening uh, from my uh, preliminary research is that a lot of this was handled at that very local level uh, and within communities and neighbor to neighbor. Um, certainly within uh, religious or church organizations, people were looking after each other and, and trying to um, minimize the impacts as much as possible. And um, overall, it seems like the opinions of most folks were they went along with these restrictions, although there certainly were, um, you know, individuals that maybe went ahead and had some of those church services and, and businesses that tried to stay open. Uh, nationally, I know there were levels um, where how, how, um, how much were the, the restrictions enforced? Uh, so for example, in um, uh, San Francisco, there's a story about um, police officers ended up actually shooting somebody uh, who was refusing to, um, uh, to honor by wearing a mask and uh, doing the things that were being called for out there. Um, I know that locally, uh, there was uh, initially a lot of the ta uh, taverns and saloons got an exemption and were able to operate. And this upset uh, the groups like the Ladies Temperance Union who were uh, trying to uh, outlaw alcohol consumption, which would come just a few um, months later uh, with the 19th Amendment, uh, uh, or sorry, the uh, um, ban on, on prohibition. Uh, and so they were very upset that those were still being allowed to, uh, to be open. So they were actively uh, groups on both sides uh, of the issues trying to, uh, to deal with the um, uh, pandemic. I don't know if we have time for maybe one more. Is there another good one here, Chris? There's a question about opening up the economy. I can tell you in, in uh, 1849, uh, the city actually bounced back pretty well. Um, uh, economic conditions were a little bit different in that um, there were so many people flowing into the city constantly with westward expansion and so forth, and there was a lot of investment in the city ahead of the epidemic that that just resumed afterwards. Um, and so the, the city actually recovered pretty well, uh, much better actually, uh, after the epidemic. And um, after 19, uh, and the, not, 1918-1919 pandemic, uh, it took uh, a little bit longer. There was more waves of influenza, which we're still um, battling these same strains today. They take a tremendous uh, number of lives uh, still today. Um, but things started to bounce back. It was a little bit tough. You just had the end of the war. Um, it was quickly followed with prohibition. Um, and then soon after that, the, the Great Depression. So it, it's kind of hard to pinpoint um, you know, a little bit of an uptick. There were so many things that were happening at that same time. And, and had huge economic impacts on the on the country, um, but a lot of those um, measures I think got um, utilized with each of these subsequent uh, outbreaks that followed um, in the days after um, the end of the pandemic. Let's see. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Chris for sharing this history with us today. And thank all of you for, for, turn, for tuning in to STL History Live. Um, again, I'll mention that if you are interested in supporting MHS through membership, you can read more on our website, mohistory.org slash support. That link is in the chat box. You'll need to copy and paste it into your browser. And also in the chat box, you can find a link to a survey. We would really appreciate if you could give us some feedback about your experience watching our Zoom programming today, which is relatively new and we are still learning and tweaking the process. So thank you for your patience and for being here. Um, and we would love for you to join us next time. I'm going to put up a slide that lists a few of the programs we have coming up. And I will say that the next one is tomorrow at noon, Hispanic military history from the American Revolution to the present. And that will be presented by Sal Valadez. Um, let's see here. 
thank you all again for joining us today. We hope to see you back tomorrow and again on Friday as well as next week and beyond. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.